life-threatening diseases are not hard to find. Even in the present day, in hospitals right now, teams of doctors are working day and night, striving to snatch back life from the hands of death for patients every day. In a hospital ward filled with the worries of patients' families, right outside the emergency room, a couple in their 50s sits anxiously, their daughter, barely 20 years old, suddenly collapsed due to a heart condition at four in the morning. The couple, tense and occasionally glancing at the room, can't see much through the foggy glass, adding to their growing anxiety. It's not until 7 a.m. that the emergency room light turns red, bringing relief to the wife as she grabs her husband's hand. There, the light is on, the doctors are coming out. Unfortunately, we couldn't save your daughter, no, our Alicia. The husband grasps the doctor's hand urgently. Doctor, our family only has one daughter to comfort us in our old age. Now that she's gone, what are we going to do? Please try harder. I'll pay any amount of money. Even if I have to sell everything we own, please. Before he can say more, the doctor interrupts and holds the couple's hands. Both of you, even a billionaire has to die. Please don't be too sad. If you linger, she won't be able to move on. We've wrapped her in a white sheet. Please have one last look before we take her body. At this moment, the wife is in shock. She speaks up. How much do you need, doctor? What if we can't afford it? The husband startles, squeezing his wife's shoulder before speaking. Are you out of your mind? The doctor has tried his best. Why are you saying such things? The wife persists firmly. I know what you want. Please be silent. The husband turns to apologize to the doctor on behalf of his wife. Then the doctor and nurse leave. The couple rushes into the room to see their daughter for the last time. As the procedures are completed, Alicia's body is transferred home within two hours. The wife is still crying, inconsolable. From the moment they left the hospital until they arrived home, never leaving her daughter's body. Finally, Alicia is brought home, their house, neither large nor small, sits snugly in a field of corn. They have been living here for a long time, the husband, a doctor who treats everyone regardless of their wealth, is revered in the community. However, his wife, a former turmeric seller, tarnished her reputation with her greed and deceit, forcing them to live here in seclusion. Despite their differences, they love each other wholeheartedly, giving rise to Alicia's beauty. Unfortunately, the girl is no more. Breathing her last without seeing her loved ones around noon, everything is prepared for Alicia's burial. The wife, exhausted, had fallen asleep earlier. She startles awake upon hearing her husband's phone call outside. She listens. Today, at exactly 4 p.m., the children will come to help bury little Alicia, right, sir? Not knowing what follows, she hears vaguely. Either her ears are ringing from fatigue, or she's half asleep, unable to make out the rest. She rushes outside, but finds no one but her daughter's new home, a cramped space. She pours herself a glass of water, feeling parched. Indeed, they skipped lunch due to grief, so she feels famished. She heads to the kitchen to prepare some food. Despite her typically frugal nature, she cooks meticulously. However, today, while cutting vegetables, she accidentally cuts her hand. Blood spills, and in her panic, she wraps it with a soft cloth forgetting to clean the blood on the floor. She only remembers her growling stomach, and after a while, returns with her hand bandaged. She serves a bowl of noodles to her husband, pretending as if nothing happened. Outside, her husband starts eating, but noticing his absence, she asks, where were you? I was calling my students to help bury our daughter. Hold on. Are you really planning to bury her? Are you crazy? She's dead. 
Why wouldn't we bury her? That's not it. Why do I feel like she's not dead? Or could you open the casket for me to see? The husband, choking on his noodles, replies after clearing his throat, Oh my, are you mad? Don't you want to help me? The wife speaks angrily, and the husband reluctantly agrees one last time. They approach the coffin, but even the flimsy lid is too heavy for him to lift, annoyed. The wife steps forward and effortlessly opens it, shocking her husband. What? How are you feeling so strong? I don't know anymore. I feel so healthy. But let me see our daughter. Opening it, she sees her daughter's body turning green, bones and veins protruding in an eerie manner, the color of decay. A foul smell emanates from the casket, alarming the husband. All right, close it back up. She might turn into a ghost. The husband urges, his wife's sudden strength unnerving him. She angrily closes the lid. But you, what are you hiding inside you? The wife clutched the coffin of her daughter, Alicia. For dear life, almost falling over from shock. Her husband, seeing this, became even more suspicious. He approached her, but even though the coffin was closed, the smell of death still lingered in the room, making him unbearable to stay. However, his wife calmly watched him run out and showed no reaction to the horrific smell. The husband ran to the door, where his students had arrived to help. If it weren't for his profession as a doctor, no one would have come to help them. The four young men prepared to carry Alicia's coffin on their shoulders. The husband stood at the front of the coffin, directing the four men to carry it to the back of the house. Meanwhile, the wife held a black umbrella to shield herself from the sun and carried a bowl of fresh flowers. She followed them, looking more cheerful than she had in the morning. Was she in shock? Or had she already overcome and accepted the pain? A moment later, they arrived at the final resting place of the unfortunate daughter. Everything was done simply, as they didn't know anyone well here. The ceremony was done with heart, not formality. The coffin was placed in the pit. The couple sprinkled marigolds and chrysanthemums on it, and then covered it with soil. Alicia was finally at peace. The husband thanked his students and gave each of them some money, but they refused. One of them spoke on behalf of the others. You are like a father to us, so it is our duty to help. Please keep this for your wife and family. We will be on our way. The husband was touched by their words. He had already cried for Alicia, and now he was easily moved to tears of joy by the kindness of his students. He could only hug each of them before they bid farewell to the couple. At night, without a clock to strike eleven, no one would have known it was eleven o'clock. The house of the couple was gloomy. Today was another day without electricity. The flickering oil lamp was their only source of light in the house. On Alicia's altar were to large candles, bright enough to illuminate the portrait of the beautiful girl smiling gently. Ironically, the more the father cried, the happier the girl seemed to smile, which made him even sadder. As for the wife, he only noticed her now. He wondered why she didn't cry anymore. He thought to himself, I'm weaker than her. That's good. Let's get over it, suddenly. He stopped thinking when he saw his wife holding a different lamp and walking to the kitchen. He asked her, It's so late, why aren't you going to bed? I have to make some dinner. We've already eaten. I'm making dinner for Alicia. Hearing this, the husband realized that his wife was not forgetting or accepting the painful truth, but had perhaps lost her mind. But what could he do? He had to pretend to be with the only wife. He had left in the world, so he said again. He clicked his tongue and hugged the pillow, turning his back to the wall. Just then, the bedroom door opened and his wife walked in. He turned around quickly, 
Are you done? Yes, I'm done. It's late. We should go to bed. The wife carefully pulled the blankets over her husband, then covered herself with the blankets as well. Only then did the husband fall asleep. Perhaps he was too anxious earlier, because he was thinking too much, so he couldn't sleep. Now he could finally sleep soundly. He had been so hard to sleep before, but now he felt like he had been drugged. He closed his eyes and fell into a deep sleep immediately. On the other side, the wife was silent and still. She lay very straight, and after a while, she turned on her side and faced the wall. It was unknown whether she was asleep or not. The husband's snoring became louder and clearer because he was very tired and he fell asleep. Soundly. The husband slept soundly for a long time, then suddenly woke up because he had reached out to hug his wife beside him in his dream, but only found a large pillow. His wife was nowhere to be found, causing him to sit up straight. He quickly grabbed the flashlight on the nightstand and stepped out of the room to look for her. He should have called her, but he found her behavior strange and decided to investigate quietly. He chose to remain silent, treading like a cat, and walked straight to the living room. He looked at the clock and saw that it was almost midnight. Next to it was his daughter's altar, since the family always turned off all the lights. Before going to bed, the only light now was the candle on the altar. As he walked past Alicia's altar, he turned around and took a closer look at the picture. He clearly saw a red streak like blood in the corner of her eye. The faint light from the two candles next to her allowed him to see it even without shining a light from afar. He quickly walked over and saw that the picture was still normal. With nothing but the beautiful Alicia, he touched his forehead, thinking he might have a fever and was hallucinating. He needed to find his wife quickly, since there were only two of them. He couldn't rest assured without her. He also wanted to know what happened to his wife, who had been acting so strangely. He remembered that she had tried to hide something earlier that day and hadn't answered him. He stopped there to burn incense for his daughter and then quickly went to look for his wife. Suddenly, he saw the light of an oil lamp he walked past the kitchen. The light was dimly lit behind the transparent glass curious to know if his wife was inside. He looked in, but saw no one except the oil lamp that was about to run out. He opened the door and stepped in with the flashlight, only to find the whole kitchen in a mess. Cooking oil was splattered everywhere, on the stove and on the cupboard. He grabbed a towel next to him and wiped it off, but he heard a strange noise outside the living room. He couldn't hear it clearly only that it was coming from somewhere that didn't know what it was. It was strange that it was sometimes small and sometimes loud. He hurriedly dropped the mess and ran to the living room. He was startled to see an unusually large rat on his daughter's altar. It was pulling flowers and gnawing on everything. He angrily ran over to chase it away, but it was fearless and didn't run away. What kind of rat was this big? He thought to himself and saw it hide behind Alicia's picture. He ran to get a whip to chase it away, but when he ran back, he couldn't find it anywhere. Only now did he remember that he had forgotten to look for his wife. He went all over the house and saw a light in the warehouse. As he walked over to it, the light seemed to move and then disappeared. He was curious, though a little scared because everything was happening so strangely and eerily. Although he was afraid, his curiosity overcame him and he gently opened the door to the warehouse. He saw a plate and a bowl inside, with leftover food still hot as if someone had just eaten it. Before he could think any further, he heard his wife's voice from inside because their warehouse was very large. He had stored medicines there to treat people for a long time. So there was another room inside the warehouse that stored other miscellaneous items. This time, he was not afraid because he knew his wife was here. 
so he walked straight ahead. After a while, he saw the light of the oil lamp, so his wife must be inside. He opened the door to the last room and was horrified to see his wife under the dim lights. She was holding a bloody cleaver and dripping it on the ground, causing his eyes to widen. Next to her was a human corpse that had been skinned, with only a few pieces of bone left, lying right behind his medicine boxes. Why for you? You killed someone. He was about to scream when she panicked and threw a bag of powder at him. White smoke billowed out and his head suddenly spun. On the ground was a black covered book with very classical red letters. He staggered and heard his wife's voice. I am a virtuous and capable wife. I didn't kill anyone. I am a good wife. I am a good mother. He repeating in a trance. The husband immediately fell to the ground unconscious. It turned out that the book, there was a book of evil magic. Before marrying him, the wife was a descendant of a long-standing line of witches. Before selling turmeric powder, she used spells to do many evil things. However, when she met her husband, her love for him made her reconsider. He also knew about her past and thought that maybe he could change her. But he never expected that after all these decades. She still hadn't given up black magic. That book was not simply a family heirloom. It also had a terrifying feature. Wherever the book was, there would be a demon guarding it. The demon would stay by its side and wait for an opportunity to incite the keeper of the book to do what it wanted. Wait a minute. Maybe for the past few decades, she had truly forgotten about those dark things until this afternoon. In the afternoon, before Alicia's coffin was buried, she was cooking and cut her hand, causing blood to drip onto the floor. Although she had forgotten to clean up the blood at first, she remembered when she came back and went back inside to find something strange. After observing carefully, she saw that there was still some blood that hadn't been cleaned up. In the ashes of the stove, she saw a demon with the shape of a mouse with sharp claws and a human face crawling out. It approached the remaining blood and licked it up with its long tongue like a gecko. She was stunned when it spoke and called her. Have you seen everything? Come in, I will help you. Your daughter will be revived at midnight if you accept my conditions. Hearing this, she didn't hesitate and stepped inside. What are the conditions? To save your daughter, you must do these things every day. You must take three drops of blood from three different people and give it to me to drink. After taking the blood, you must leave the meat of the people you kill for me. Do you accept? Seeing its appearance, she remembered everything from the past. Her family had told her about a cursed book guarded by a demon. It was a terrifyingly powerful demon. If she had it in her hands, she could do anything. So she asked it. Do you accept? Seeing its appearance, she remembered everything from the past. Her family had told her about a cursed book guarded by a demon. It was a terrifyingly powerful demon. If she had it in her hands, she could do anything. So she asked it. Are you the demon guarding my family's ancient book? Yes. I have been living in these ashes for all these years. But I didn't want to reveal myself. Now is the time. We will cooperate and benefit each other. Good. I am a member of the clan. I will cooperate with you. What do I need to do now? The demon then gave her a packet of white powder and told her to sprinkle it on Alicia's body in the coffin. No matter how decomposed it was, it would be revived completely. So the thing that she hid from her husband was this magical powder. And the mouse that the husband saw on Alicia's altar was actually this demon. The covenant with the demon began from here. Right at that moment when the clock struck 12 times, echoing loudly signaling the time to do the final task, as instructed by that demon. After midnight, Alicia would be resurrected, but during that time, 
The coffin lid must be opened for the vital energy to enter the body to complete the recovery. The wife did not hesitate any longer, hurriedly grabbed a shovel from behind the other miscellaneous boxes of her husband and ran back to where her husband lay unconscious, addressing the standing demon. Hey, you must not harm him. He's my husband, I know, hurry up. Bring your daughter up here. Trust me to take care of him. After that, she ran quickly with the shovel to the burial direction of her daughter. Empowered by the demon, she became strong and hastily dug up the soil in the middle of the night without any light. The sandy soil scattered as she tirelessly dug and dug. The stillness of midnight only interrupted by the sound of her shovel and a sudden thud as the shovel hit Alicia's coffin lid, creating a loud noise. The neighbor's dog began to bark nervously, but her work continued. She joyfully dug up to the burial pit of the coffin, tossing the shovel aside and using her hands to dig. In the midst of the night, the mist floated like incense, creating a chillingly eerie atmosphere. Though the moon was out, it wasn't very bright. The strength she received earlier helped her clearly see what was happening at night. She began to use ancient sorcery, chanting spells that slowly raised the coffin as if pulled by someone. When the coffin lid was clearly on the ground, the dog kept barking in chaos. She opened the coffin lid and threw it to the ground. As the coffin lid opened, red smoke poured out, disappearing into thin air. A human skeleton rose from the coffin, startling nearby birds, causing them to flee their nests, sensing a terrifying frequency of demons. The dog from the other side of the fence rushed over. When it saw the scene, heading towards her and the skeleton, it kept barking while she glared at the skeleton. Did it deceive me? As she finished speaking, the skeleton fell down. She approached to look inside the coffin where it wasn't dark, but rather a dim red mysterious glow, with smoke rising from below. She could clearly see Alicia intact, unlike when she was buried. Her skin now pale, with a hint of blue, lips faded as if soaked in ice water. Tears streamed down her face as she touched her daughter's body. Feeling the warmth of human life passing on, Alicia opened her eyes, her initially cold skin gradually warming up. Her eyes blinking as if just waking up from a dream, the dog barked, making Alicia jump in fear. Trembling, angrily, she shouted, stay away, get back. The dog persisted, so she angrily grabbed the shovel she had thrown aside and struck the dog, causing it to yelp in pain, blood pouring onto the ground. Alicia, no longer afraid, whimpered silently in her mouth like a mute person. She called out, Alicia. Unable to contain herself, she called her. But Alicia remained silent, not responding. She had to call again before Alicia startled and her eyes could blink like a normal person. The strong smell of decaying corpses vanished completely. Replaced by the pungent smell of ashes, Alicia now resembled an innocent child. Smiling and calling out to her, Mom. The mother joyfully embraced the little girl, Alicia. Then, Alicia was resurrected, and her mother held her hand to help her out of the coffin. She came to her mother and hugged her even tighter. But at that moment, her mother said, All right, there's not much time left. Come with me quickly to drink blood. Before the two could enter the house, the coffin suddenly fell back into the burial pit with a loud crash. Immediately, the light from Mrs. Sarah's house turned on, and then she took a flashlight and went out. The two hurriedly ran to hide among the nearby banana bushes. Fortunately, Mrs. Sarah couldn't see the coffin and them from her side, because there was more dust and grass obscuring the view. Mrs. Sarah shone the light for a while, then went back inside, closing the door and turning off the light to continue sleeping. Now the mother could breathe a sigh of relief. She asked her daughter to go into the house. Alicia said nothing, just smiled and nodded before following her mother inside, back to that warehouse. 
the mother took out a bowl of blood and scooped up a small spoonful of blood. She turned to ask the demon, what if she drinks more than three drops of blood? No problem. Three drops of blood sustain life for a day. Drinking more won't extend it. Okay. Having heard that, she was truly reassured. She called Alicia, who didn't hesitate to open her mouth. The mother gave her daughter three small spoonfuls of blood, equivalent to three drops of blood. After drinking, Alicia's skin became warmer and a rosy hue filled her with vitality. Somehow, she seemed to understand everything and didn't show any reaction when she saw the bizarre demon. Next to her father, the demon then smiled and said, Very good, three drops every day is enough. Now, it's my turn. Saying that, it dragged the human body from behind the boxes and opened its mouth wide, consuming the entire flesh and bone voraciously. After consuming the flesh, it cleaned its mouth neatly, both mother and daughter could only thank it and silently watched it leave the warehouse. The next morning, the husband woke up with a severe headache. He found himself in bed and was startled because he vaguely remembered going out of the room to find his wife last night. But now he was here and he couldn't remember anything afterward. His memory of the previous day was completely wiped out. Missus. Sarah brought in a bowl of hot porridge and said, are you awake? The husband, confused, replied, what do you mean? What happened to me? Weren't you running a high fever and unconscious yesterday? Don't you remember? I had a high fever. Why can't I remember anything? My head hurts. Don't worry. I asked Alicia to go to the market to buy medicine for you. HMM. Huh. Are you losing your mind? She's dead already, isn't she? You've really lost your mind. You forgot that she woke up. Right after I prepared to take her home. What are you saying? I don't understand anything, Dad. I'm back, hearing his daughter Alicia's voice. The husband was astonished to see his daughter walking into the room. With fever-reducing medicine in her hand, Alicia wore a black coat with a hood covering her head to shield her from the sunlight. Even though it was summer, the room was extremely hot, but she didn't take it off. The husband couldn't understand and felt even more confused. He thought Alicia's death was just a nightmare, a hallucination caused by his current fever. Little did he know, his wife had charmed Alicia to stay indoors without being detected. Despite not understanding what was happening, he was pleased that everything seemed normal now. At that moment, he could see his daughter's tender smile. Thank you, dear. Leave it there for me, he said. Okay. Then Alicia gently left his room. The wife remained to take care of him. He didn't think too much because his head hurt too much. He obediently ate the porridge his wife fed him, despite the pain. As he was about to finish eating and prepare to take his medicine, he said, Wait. What are you waiting for? There's just a little left in the bowl. Eat it quickly to get better. Wait for me for a moment. Hey, where are you going while you're sick? Despite the headache, he tried to go outside to see the altar where Alicia was last night. He saw that the altar was just an ordinary table with fresh flowers, nothing symbolizing an altar at all. His wife followed behind. He also remembered that Alicia was buried in the backyard. So he rushed out there, followed by his wife, when they arrived, he was horrified to see that where the coffin had been buried the previous afternoon was now a banana tree growing vigorously, its leaves green as if it had been there for a long time. Only then did he believe it was just a nightmare. The nightmare of his daughter's death haunted both of them. He sighed in relief and went back inside. His wife was very satisfied that she had arranged everything timely and her husband now trusted her completely. Alicia's death was his nightmare. Meanwhile, 
in her private room. Alicia stared at herself in the mirror. Her room was extremely dark day and night, and since the light was not facing her, the room was full of gloomy, chilling vibes. She stood in front of the mirror, her eyes gazing into the void. Seeing her own reflection, her beautiful rosy skin filled her with pride. She admired herself in the mirror and suddenly spoke. She doesn't know that I'm not her daughter. Then her smile made the reflection in the mirror blurred, and everything became hazy in the mirror. It was no longer Alicia in the reflection. As if a distortion had occurred, yet she continued. Thanks to her kindness, her motherly love, I have come to this world. I have acquired a new, beautiful appearance, Alicia's appearance higher. Wait and see. What will I do with this beautiful identity of Alicia? Ha 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 ha. Unexpectedly, what was thought to be the resurrection of a daughter turned out to be the unwitting resurrection of a demon, bringing the demon home as her child. The demon inside Alicia's body, fake Alicia, didn't leave her room, but stood admiring herself in the mirror like a narcissist, surprisingly. When the mother entered the room, the reflection in the mirror returned to its original state. She entered carrying a bag and said to her daughter, Tonight is the second day. You have to continue drinking human blood to sustain your life. So before that, I have to go find someone to catch. Remember, don't leave the house while your parents are still at home. You can only go out when we're in the garden, but you must avoid places with sunlight. These are the instructions the demon gave me. Absolutely do not take off this coat with a hood, because sunlight will destroy your demon soul. I know you're not a human, but you're still my daughter, so only when night falls can you be free to do whatever you want. Now, it's time to go to the strawberry garden. Fake Alicia didn't respond, she just smiled. Then her mother went out to work in the garden as usual. The couple had a strawberry garden on the hill behind the house, but today, the husband was sick, so the wife went alone. After her mother left, the demon inside Alicia's body began to control her, taking a sharp knife to cut a line on her finger, then waited for the blood to flow and splashed it onto the mirror. The blood flowed down and suddenly seemed to seep into the mirror and disappear, finally. There was the laughter of a female demon. Time passed quickly, finally. The sun was about to set over the hills, and the night was descending upon the village. The husband was still deeply asleep from noon until now. After drinking all the medicine his wife had given him, he slept as if he had forgotten everything, sinking into a deep slumber. Meanwhile, fake Alicia, now that the sun was setting and the sunlight had faded, was no longer in her room. At that moment, her mother returned from the garden. She hurried to her husband's room to check on him, seeing him sleeping soundly. She sighed with relief and went to her daughter's room to find Alicia. The mother tiptoed to her daughter's room. At this moment, the sun had truly set and the night was dark. She held a flashlight and asked, why so silent? Is the little one in her room? She pulled the door open slowly. Since the door was made of wood, it made a creaking sound as it opened, sending chills down her spine. She shone the light around, but couldn't see her daughter. She called out, and from behind, Alicia appeared, saying, Where are you going, Mom? I'm going to catch someone. You stay home and look after your father. Mom, don't worry. Since Alicia obeyed, her mother felt truly relieved and continued her dark work. Catching people was much easier for her because of her past crimes, one of which was particularly heinous, killing pregnant women and consuming their fetuses for her s. pals. Although no one knew what she had done, she had moved to another village before marrying her current husband. Love had caused her to pause, but her wicked nature hadn't changed over the decades, even though her crimes had reduced. 
Outside, on the dirt road, the rural village was desolate. Unlike the bustling city, it was eerily silent and dark, especially without the moon that night. The dirt road was pitch black. She sat in the bushes, not daring to swat away the mosquitoes. She knew that at this time, a boy from the neighboring village walked back home because they couldn't afford a bicycle, so he had to walk. She had been waiting since seven o'clock, but by almost eight o'clock, there was no sign of the boy. She nodded off several times, but because of her daughter, she tried harder. Although it was quiet here, there were still houses around. A slight noise could alert them and their dogs. She accidentally got bitten by a mosquito and brushed it away. At that moment, she was no different from a thief. She was about to steal the life of an innocent boy. At exactly eight o'clock, the air became even quieter. She dozed off in the bushes, but suddenly heard voices in the distance due to the quiet surroundings. The little schoolboy said to his mother, Mom, why did you suddenly decide to ride the bike with me today? Seeing how hard my son studies, I can't bear to see you tired anymore. From now on, we'll borrow Auntie High's bike, and I'll take you to school. It's dangerous to come home at night, my son. Yes, it's been a long time since I've ridden a bike. Come on. Mom, let's go home. I'm starving. Then the mother's flashlight accidentally shone into the bushes, blinding her, however. Neither she nor her son but into the bushes, so they didn't see her. Their bike passed by without noticing her, disappearing into the distance. After the mother and son rode away, she was angry and muttered to herself, awful, I wasted hours waiting, and now it's all ruined. Only that little brat is the easiest target. Who would have thought, with that, she angrily walked away. She had lost her prey, but she consoled herself, knowing there would be other opportunities. Seeing the prey, she tried to pay attention, but around her was still desolate, no one in sight. Only that man kept walking as if he didn't know the Grim Reaper was waiting in front of him. At this moment, the man suddenly fell down while walking, crying. It seemed he was heartbroken or saddened by something to drink. So much that he got drunk like this. She stood from afar, not hearing clearly, but vaguely knowing that he was lamenting his fate. She walked closer, hiding a knife behind her back, calmly moving as if nothing was happening. When she got closer to him, she could see that he was completely intoxicated, his mind as confused as that of a madman. She intruded while he was crying and asked, who are you? Why are you crying here? His response was cold and angry. What's it to you? Get lost. HMM, such impoliteness, talking to an elder like that. Hearing those words only made him more furious, standing up and shouting, are you my mother? Get lost. Or okay asterisk asterisk elu. As he spoke, he pulled out a shiny knife. And because there was a house nearby, the light could shine enough to see a sharp iron knife. She wasn't afraid, but she pretended to be scared. Hesitatingly continued to walk away. After walking a distance, he fell flat on the ground, throwing away the knife. He lay there, completely drunk, presenting an opportunity for her. Without hesitation, she trod on his head, causing him pain. But she pressed him down so hard that he couldn't scream, only weakly moan. Too weak for anyone to hear and help. She took his knife and slashed across the back of his neck. He wreathed in agony in a pool of blood. But the pain couldn't be relieved because he couldn't scream. She continued to cut until his head came off, and his struggle ceased. Thanks to the distant light reflecting back, the prey lost his head. She was delighted, but she couldn't bring the body back to offer to the demon. So, she just took the head with the blood-soaked shirt of his to Alicia first. Meanwhile, fake Alicia, now that the sun was setting and the sunlight had faded, was no longer in her room. At that moment, 
her mother returned from the garden. She hurried to her husband's room to check on him. Seeing him sleeping soundly, she sighed with relief and went to her daughter's room to find Alicia. She hastily removed his bloody shirt to wrap his head, then chuckled quietly, preparing to return. But ahead, an old man, probably her age, was approaching, causing her to panic, hiding the head behind her back. She was horrified to see the old man holding a flashlight. If he saw a headless body on the ground, it wouldn't be okay. She was startled when she saw him approaching, intending to flee, but tripped and dropped the head, rolling near the nearby river. The old man also arrived, seemingly less drunk than the young man, with a bottle of liquor in his hand. Sighing with relief, because drunk people's eyesight would be worse than normal, especially in the darkness, let alone at night, and the flashlight wouldn't illuminate much in such darkness. She waited until he called her. You there? What are you doing here? I'm here on business. What's it to you? Why are you holding? Something in your hand, old man. Don't make a fuss. It's my business. Stop. He ran over and grabbed her hand, making her angry. Struggling to break free, then tearing off the ring, causing him to fall over. She picked up the head and the knife and ran home with all her might. Later, he accidentally hit his head on the ground, so he fainted right there with the headless body and a strong smell of blood on the road. The next morning, when the two men went to work, they found the body and the old man. They immediately reported to the police, who quickly arrived at the scene along with a crowd of people, including the old man's son, who angrily ran into the crowd calling for his father to wake up. At that moment, a young policeman asked, Is that your father? Do you know that a murder happened here? Because the body was covered with a white cloth. Before the old man's son arrived, he didn't notice much and didn't know. Hearing that, he was terrified and asked again, Here, officer. Yeah. What's noteworthy here is that your old man collapsed next to that body. So, Maybe he knows something about this brutal murderer. The young policeman nodded and turned to wake up the old man. And they asked him. But suddenly, a woman interrupted. It seems he's drunk. How can we trust his statement? The policeman said, It's okay. At least there's some clue. The old man then remembered last night and said, I remember now, last night. I met a suspicious woman. As soon as he finished speaking, the crowd started murmuring, Heavens! The murderer is a woman. Oh my God! Who could be so wicked? Everyone! Calm down and help! The policeman said before they calmed down. Then turning to him, he said, Sir, let me remind you that you held that woman's hand, and then I accidentally broke her ring. It seems like the ring was still in my hand. When I fell to the ground unconscious, that's all I remember, so where's that ring? Hearing that, he looked back and saw that the ring was missing. Even around there, there was no ring, let alone at the crime scene. Then the woman who had interrupted earlier spoke up again. See, clearly, he's hallucinating when he's drunk. Look around, there's no ring anywhere. So the whole neighborhood started discussing true. There's no ring to be found. The policeman sighed and asked them to calm down, then turned to the two father and son. All right, for now. Let's take you both to the station for a more practical interrogation. Okay. Then the police dispersed them to prepare to take the body away, and the case temporarily stopped. When the police car carrying the headless body left the scene, suddenly, a gust of wind blew the white cloth off the body, causing everyone on the car to be horrified. The flesh was all gone, only bones without a skull. That demon had come to enjoy its share as agreed with the mother, without the body. The investigation became completely in the dark, with no identification documents and everything already inside the mother's shirt. 
nothing could be verified, and this incident made them worry about the involvement of demons. Oh my god, why is there only a set of bones left? A female nurse accompanying the police car screamed in shock, causing an atmosphere filled with suspicion and confusion. The police had to pick up a piece of cloth and cover the remaining skeleton, unable to comprehend what had happened. Just moments ago, they had lifted a body onto the car, but now only terrifying white bones remained. Afterwards, the car left the village, disappearing into the dust and smoke on the road. The case left a big question mark for the investigation, a deadlock that couldn't be explained. Meanwhile, at Alicia's house, her husband was feeling better today, but his mind was still foggy and uncomfortable. His fever had subsided, yet he continued to forget things before and after that night. He had no knowledge of witchcraft or dark magic because he was just a kind-hearted doctor. He never thought he had been cursed with anything, attributing his forgetfulness to old age, a normal occurrence. As for their daughter, he fully trusted his wife's words, believing that the child was not dead. The incidents continued to repeat themselves during the day. The couple worked in the strawberry fields, returning home in the evening to eat and rest. Meanwhile, the wife went out to capture people to obtain blood for their daughter to drink. Her actions became even more mysterious as the deaths targeted those who wandered alone at night, often occurring in deserted areas surrounded by trees. The secretive actions seemed to be aided by supernatural forces, making her no different from a demonic entity manipulating a human guise. The police intervened, but every case was shrouded in supernatural elements, terrifying the entire village. The murderer was given the name Shadow Ghost, Consequently, no one dared to venture out alone at night. At the very least, they went in pairs. What was especially peculiar was that the demon insisted on only killing one person each day. The shadow ghost continues to claim victims. With nine murders already occurring in the village, the police were extremely frustrated by the rampant killings. Unable to do anything about the increasingly serious situation, they couldn't just stand by. They were determined to surveil and capture the deathly shadow. The next day, on a night with a full moon, the brightly lit village saw a young man from another village rowing a small boat on the river. His boat was filled with fresh flowers, perhaps intended for sale to worshippers at the temple. It was still early, around seven o'clock in the evening. He was alone on the water while two men stood on the shore frog hunting. Spotting the young man, they called out, Hey, you there. Turning around, the young man saw no one nearby. He looked to the right and saw the two men on the bank. They were calling out to him, thinking they might want to buy something. He quickly steered the boat to the shore. As he reached land, one of the men asked, Where are you heading all alone? The young man replied honestly, I'm taking these flowers to the temple to sell. You look out of place. Aren't you from around here? The man inquired. I'm from the upper part of the village. I heard there's a big gathering here. So I brought flowers to sell, the young man explained. Why don't you sell them in your own village? More people here means more sales. My village is small and poor. Besides, someone placed an order, so I'm delivering the flowers. Come with us. We'll go to the temple together. The men insisted. Hearing this, the young man began to feel uneasy. Why? He asked. It's dangerous to go alone, you know. There's a killer in the village named Shadow Ghost. He targets those who wander alone. Come with us. They urged Dot. The young man grew more apprehensive. It wasn't the fear of a murderer that bothered him, rather. He worried that they might have ill intentions, seeing him as an outsider. Nonetheless, he remained composed and replied, Thank you, but I can go by boat. The temple is just ahead. 
With that, he pushed the oars swiftly into the water. Moving away from the shore, seeing this, the men became annoyed and said, Well, suit yourself. Don't say we didn't warn you. Even the police can't handle it. The young man, increasingly skeptical, continued rowing in the cool water. The wind pushed his boat faster downstream. As he sat, he whistled cheerfully, thinking about the money he would soon earn from selling the flowers to buy medicine for his sick mother. His mother was ill, and they were a poor family. He took this job in a distant village to help his mother. However, his joy was tinged with worry. Death could come for him at any moment. At the same time, at the village temple, many people had gathered for prayers. Despite the solemn atmosphere, some attendees were disruptive, chatting and laughing loudly. The young man arrived at the temple and left the flowers on the shore to find the people who had ordered them. A wealthy couple approached him, the ones who had placed the order. They happily led him to his boat, where the man helped load the flowers onto his shoulders. It was a smooth transaction and they paid him. Though the amount wasn't large, it was enough to buy medicine for his mother, grateful. He took the money and happily descended back to his boat. Ready to depart, however, a woman holding a child's hand approached him. Hey, you, come and have dinner with everyone, she invited warmly. The young man hesitated, unsure, I, don't be shy. You must be hungry, come on, she insisted. Dot the villagers, though not affluent, were hospitable and kind, reluctantly, he agreed to join them for a simple vegetarian meal. So, they all shared a vegetarian dinner at the temple. Afterwards, he heard stories about the shadow ghost, stories that he had previously dismissed, but now remembered the warnings from the two men. He began to feel uneasy, especially now that he was full. It was too late to leave, but staying overnight at the temple was not an option. He had no acquaintances here, making it difficult to ask for shelter. Finally, he decided to explore the area for any abandoned shrines. He would stay there temporarily. Spending the night here was safer. He could leave early in the morning. With this plan in mind, as the others finished eating and went inside the hall to listen to sermons, he hurriedly left. Arriving back at his boat, he rowed to the middle of the river. The moon shone brightly, illuminating his surroundings. He admired the beauty of the night. Despite the eerie feeling caused by the dense, dark woods around him, suddenly, a loud rustling noise came from the bushes on the shore in front of him. He was frightened but curious. It couldn't be what he was thinking, could it? He noticed something white and green gleaming in the bushes. Swiftly, he brought the boat closer to the shore for a better look. As he approached, he realized he was near, too close for comfort. Beyond the trees and under the bright moonlight, he saw a woman in a blue dress holding a large knife, sitting on top of the body of a man in a white shirt. It was the clothing he had seen earlier behind the trees, shocked. He stumbled backward, accidentally hitting the oar against the side of the boat. Producing a loud thud, the woman startled, grabbed the knife, swiftly cut the body in half, and fled into the darkness. The young man, overwhelmed by fear, fainted in his boat, narrowly escaping death. 